This is Sarah Wilkinson from Humber College and the University of Guelph Humber. In this video I'm going to explain the respiratory exchange ratio as well as the respiratory quotient. These are two concepts important in exercise physiology. You'll probably want to review some of your basic energy metabolism pathways such as glycolysis, how acetyl-CoA is formed from pyruvate, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, as well as beta oxidation, in order to be able to understand the underlying basis behind RER. So in this video, I'm going to cover what is RER, what can it tell us about fuel use, the basis by which RER is determined, coming back to our energy metabolism pathways, and the difference between RER and RQ. So the respiratory exchange ratio is a ratio between the amount of carbon dioxide produced by the body versus the amount of oxygen consumed by the body. If I produce one liter of carbon dioxide for one liter of oxygen consumed, I'll have an RER of 1.0. What this can tell us is the type of fuel we're using to produce ATP. So when we see an RER of 0.7, this tells us that the person is using 100% fat to produce ATP. Whereas if we see an RER of 1.0, this tells us that the person is using 100% carbohydrate. And numbers anywhere between 0.7 and 1.0 are gonna be a mix of fat and carbohydrate. And we can use a chart to determine this. So you can see at the very top, an RER, and I'll come back to what RQ is in a second, an RER of 0.7 is 100% fat, and an RER of 1.0 means 0% fat, 100% carbohydrate. So take a moment, try this out on this chart. Let's say you get an RER of 0.76. What does this tell you in terms of carbohydrate versus fat use? So if we find 0.76, it tells us that the person is using 19.2% carbohydrate and 80.8% fat. How do we come up with this? Well, let's take a minute to look at reactions that produce carbon dioxide. Which of these reactions are going to produce carbon dioxide? So here we've got glycolysis, beta oxidation, formation of acetyl-CoA, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. Which ones produce it? So did you come up with when you take a three carbon molecule such as pyruvate and it becomes a two carbon molecule of acetyl-CoA, we have the production of carbon dioxide. The other place where carbon dioxide is produced in forming ATP is in the Krebs cycle. So you get carbon dioxide, two molecules of carbon dioxide per acetyl-CoA uh, produced there because your two carbon acetyl-CoA reacts with a four carbon citrate, and there's a series of reactions that eventually leads to formation of a whole bunch of other products, including the loss of those two carbons. This is what's gonna happen when we start with glucose. Glucose is going to have to go through glycolysis to form pyruvate, and when pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA, carbon dioxide is gonna be formed there. Further on, when the acetyl-CoA goes through the Krebs cycle, carbon dioxide is gonna be formed there. So there's a lot of carbon dioxide uh, being formed when you use glucose as the start molecule per amount of oxygen used. Now, if our starting molecule is a fatty acid, all fatty acids are even numbers. That is, they have either 18 carbons, 12 carbons, 22 carbons. And when they go through the process of beta oxidation to form acetyl-CoA, there is no carbon dioxide lost. So C18 carbon eventually becomes nine molecules of acetyl-CoA and no carbon dioxide is lost. That's going to mean that for a given amount of fatty acids per amount of oxygen consumed, there's gonna be less carbon dioxide formed. So our take home point, when using fat versus carbohydrate as fuel, less carbon dioxide is produced for a given amount of oxygen used. So let's take this a step further and do in an actual example to show you where this 0.7 and 1.0 comes from. So recall RER is VCO2 divided by VO2. 
And if we take a typical fatty acid, let's take C16, this is its chemical reaction to be able to produce ATP. So to consume this molecule in a series of chemical reactions, 23 oxygen is used and 16 carbon dioxides are formed in the process. So if we do the ratio of carbon dioxide formed to oxygen consumed, 16 divided by 23 gives us 0 0.7. And this would work out for all other fatty acids as well. Let's do the same thing for molecule glucose. So if you take your molecular formula for glucose to oxidize it, six oxygen molecules are used. And in the process, six carbon dioxide molecules are formed. And you know that anything divided by itself, so six divided by six is 1.0. And if there's a mix of fats and glucose, well, your ratio is gonna be somewhere between 0.7 and one. And that's what this chart here is going to tell us. Now you may have been wondering, well, what is this RQ business? So far you've been talking about RER. The respiratory quotient is something that can be directly measured at the tissue. So that carbon dioxide right at the tissue is measured and the consumption of oxygen at the tissue is directly measured. And to do this, invasive procedures are needed. So if you can imagine, you'd have to have both an arterial catheter as well as a venous catheter inserted right at the tissue. And if you know anything about blood pressure, arterial catheters are very complex in that there has to be pressure exerted to keep the blood in. And so this would only really be done under the supervision of a doctor. So not really practical for us regular exercise physiologists. Whereas respiratory exchange ratio is measured directly at the mouth. So VCO2 and VO2 is measured at the mouth. It's used as an indicator of what is going on at the tissue. We would do this with a pretty simple piece of machinery, a bit expensive, but very simple to operate, not invasive whatsoever. So you'd be able to use a typical metabolic cart. In an upcoming video, I'm gonna talk about challenges inherent with using respiratory exchange ratio versus respiratory quotient when conditions are not steady state. RER is great for predicting RQ when things are at steady state. So that is during very submaximal exercise, at rest under normal conditions, it's perfect for that. We get into challenges when there's hyperventilation of some sort, uh, meaning past the ventilatory threshold during an exercise test, or potentially at rest when someone uh, is hyperventilating for whatever reason. So for the most part, RER is a pretty good indication of respiratory quotient, and it's much less invasive. So to conclude in this video, we've discussed what is RER, what it can tell us about fuel use, where it comes from, and the difference between RER and RQ. Like I said in an upcoming video, I'm going to go through uh, considerations when getting an RER value as an indicator of RQ during non-steady state conditions. So uh, when someone is exercising past their ventilatory threshold or when they're hyperventilating at rest.